Hey, welcome back to Subbrief's Naval News. Today is a great day. The House Armed Services Committee has finally agreed to allow the U.S. Navy to decommission all of its littoral combat ships. All ships in the class will be decommissioned now, and that has been approved by Congress. One of the quotes coming out of the Pentagon for the reason, one of many, for doing this is to, quote, divesting from some of these old legacy platforms that are not survivable in the Indo-Pacific region, end quote. That sums it up right there, folks. And I'm going to give you all the other reasons as well. But this old legacy program that we commissioned, the most recent one this year, is not survivable in modern naval combat. And that that is something that was obvious to everyone in the Navy for years, which is why they were asking Congress time and time again that, hey, please stop building these ships, stop spending this money, you know, billions of dollars, and let's spend this money on systems that actually can fight, like the early Burke Flight 2 Alpha is a great option, or the new Constellation class that has been designed and is now under construction and arguably one of the reasons why Congress finally agreed to this. They had to keep the money flowing for as long as the shipyard building the LCS is one in, uh, down on the Gulf Coast and one up here in Wisconsin uh, was getting paid to do so. The shipyard in Wisconsin that was building the Freedom Class is now building the new frigate, the Constellation Class. And that money was never interrupted, which is why I think the House Armed Services Committee uh, didn't want to decommission these ships beforehand. They had to keep keep that money coming until the frigates came online, that construction came online. So these ships basically are not survivable in modern naval combat because they prioritize speed over survivability. And they only have enough crew on board to barely operate the systems that are on board because of all the automation and stuff. They reduce the crew size, which is great until you take casualties and you no longer have the crew to operate the ship despite all of its automation. And if you wanted to repair damage, who's going to do it? Yeah, if the crew has been diminished, you don't have enough people to operate it, much less repair the ship. Therefore, it's not that survivable. And you're not going to be out running even a subsonic cruise missile in, in modern warfare. So the speed was not an advantage in a blue water naval fight. Also, the mechanical and engineering issues continue to plague this program despite hot fixes being done during its some 15 year long development. It did not also have any offensive capability to speak of. It didn't add offensive, long range offensive capability to the fleet. So it didn't really have a purpose in a blue, blue water fight. Uh, the US Navy's new strategy has been now for some 10 years, a diverse fleet arsenal, getting away from ships that have a large battery of missiles to many ships with a medium and small size battery of long range missiles. Well, this didn't have any long range weapons on it. Therefore, it was more of a liability to the fleet than it was an actual asset. The role of this ship, the LCS program, the whole class in the from the beginning was to have modules that could be swapped out. It was quickly learned that in practice, the swapping out of these modules was not even practical, much less efficient. Um, there was a surface warfare module, an ASW warfare module, and a mine hunting capability module. Uh, the surface warfare module didn't have enough uh, long range weapons to make it worth its while. It didn't have any good, good punch. It didn't really add to that arsenal. The ASW module never worked properly. And the mine capability module, while it did come online after some eight years of development, it was very limited in its ability. Uh, to, to find mines. I mean, you might as well just send the ship out there into a minefield until it stops becoming a ship anymore to find to find its mine. But that was not adding to the uh, the capability of the fleet at all. So the cancellation of these modules really limited the ship's uh, role in the United States Navy fleet. Now, there is some talk about some other navies maybe buying these ships after we decommission them. Uh, if that happens, we'll cover that here. But I do want to point out that the House Armed Services Committee was the major one holding up these decommissions for years, and it really looks like that that was uh, mo motivated by money to keep the money flowing to these shipyards because the representatives of those districts were on the House Armed Services Committee, and they had the support of their fellow um, House representatives to, to keep this program going despite its absolute ineffectiveness. But thankfully, that's finally coming to an end. 
All right, so we're gonna use the powerful tool that is ground.news to take a look at some international stories that might affect the US Navy and the United States by extension. The first one that popped up in my feed is China Navy training ship visits the Philippines. And the reason why this is important to us is that the relationship between the United States and the Philippines, as far as the Navy is concerned, kind of fell apart in the 1980s and 90s, where they eventually closed the base in Subic Bay. Now, we've been working recently on trying to rebuild relationships with the Philippines, and we've made a lot of progress. We've gotten to the point now where the United States has uh, committed to building nine facilities in the Philippines to help support them. So we're really making some good progress here, but look at this. Uh, China is now visiting them in a goodwill tour, uh, having this large training ship uh, visit them. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to our center stories are, that are highly factually based, and uh, the service ground.news sorts it by that. So right at the very top, we have Channel News Asia. It's a center uh, perspective with high factuality rating. So we're gonna just open up this link. You can also click on read full article right there if you wanted to. And so there. here we see China Navy training ship visit the Philippines headline uh, from Manila, a Chinese Navy training vessel berthed in the Philippines on Wednesday, June 14th for a rare port visit as the two countries contest reefs and waters in the South China Sea. So that's a great perspective to put this visit in is that there's been a lot of um, encounters between the Chinese Coast Guard and the Philippine Coast Guard to the point of shining high intensity lasers at each other's bridge. Well, China is accused of <laughs> doing that to the Philippine Coast Guard and also interrupting supply drops to uh, atolls that are around the Philippine uh, islands that are occupied by the Philippine uh, Marines. And they just want to get fresh, fresh food and water out to them. And China has been interrupting that. So in the, in the midst of that type of controversy and that type of environment, this goodwill visit is happening. The Chinese ambassador says that this is just a goodwill visit. And they also um, distributed pamphlets that says uh, this ship um, that's visiting conveys the concept of mutual trust and concerning China's peaceful development. So a little bit of propaganda to go with it, but Hey, propaganda is just diplomacy in disguise, right? So this is an opportunity here to maybe begin reducing tensions a little bit between China, the Philippines, and by extension, the United States as well. Uh, we'll see if anything actually comes of this. You know, I'm not ignorant to what this visit actually is, but one can always hope that maybe something positive will come out of this. So this uh, ship called the Qi Zhang Gu. I don't know what this ship is called. I can't read that word. This Chinese ship is larger than any Philippine warship or Coast Guard vessel uh, that the Philippines has. And it's the first Chinese naval ship to visit the Philippines since Verdan Marcos won presidency last year. That's right. Ferdinand is back apparently. So Marcos, the leader of the Philippines added, there's differences between China and the Philippines and they certainly exist, but it is not something that will be that will define our relationship. So that's a di very diplomatic way of saying, hey, <clears throat> we can at least talk about our differences and maybe resolve some of them. So I'm cautiously optimistic that this type of visit, uh, it's not a warship, it's a training vessel coming to the Philippines, uh, will actually open up maybe some dialogue and reduce some of the you know, hostile actions and reduce some of the tensions in the region. Let me know what you guys think. But uh, this, is a, um, this is a development that you don't see here in mainstream media in the United States. So I thought you might find this uh, story interesting. You can still save 30% on your Ground.News subscription by using my link in the description. Definitely check it out. This is a very good service. And uh, I want to leave you here with a little bit of a somber note, but one that deserves recognition is uh, Chief Gunner's mate Caprice Pryor has uh, passed away while underway on board USS Ramage, deployed with the Gerald R. Ford Carrier Strike Group out there uh, doing their work in the North Sea. He was medevaced to a Norwegian hospital where he was later pronounced dead of a medical issue that they did not go into any details. Uh, Chief Pryor enlisted in the Navy in 1998. He served on many cruisers and destroyers, had a very successful 25 year career, and he was continuing to serve his country at sea at the time of his passing. So I would like to take this moment to extend our deepest condolences from everyone here at Subreef to the family and crew of Chief Gunner's mate, Caprice Pryor. Farewell, Chief.